Welcome to the Arts and Humanities Faculty Research Series 2021. I'm Hussein Kassim, I'm the Professor of Politics at the University of East Anglia, Senior, Senior Fellow of UK and Changing Europe, and convener of this series, After Brexit, Utopia or Dystopia. We're meeting fortnightly to hear leading figures discuss their views about the future, the role that the UK should play in the world, whether Global Britain has a realistic vision, whether the UK as a union is under strain, and relations with the UK's neighbours. Normally we'd be meeting in Norwich Castle, but this year for reasons of which we're all too, too aware, we've had to uh, retreat online. That means we won't be able to ask questions in the flesh, we won't be able to meet each other as it were, but you can put your questions to, um, to our guest, to our guest speaker, um, Mr. John Bruton, using the, um, the Q&A um, function at the very bottom of the, of the page. So you can start doing that from whenever you have a question. So during the lecture, but also afterwards, just press on the QA button at the bottom of your screen. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this, which is our second event. In the first, we heard from Daniel Hannan, who's the founder of Vote Leave. Um, tonight, I have the privilege of introducing John Bruton. John is an Irish uh, former Fine Gael politician who in an illustrious um, career served as Taoiseach, Prime Minister of Ireland, and as EU Ambassador to the United States. Born in Meath, John was elected to the Dáil for the Meath um, constituency in 1969 at the age of 22. He served continuously as the parliamentary representative for Meath until he retired from domestic politics in 2004, that's 35 years later. Um, John held his first Trump bench position in 1977. He became uh, Minister of Finance at the age of 34 in 1981, the first of a number of ministerial portfolios he held in the 1980s. He became leader of Fianna Foyle in 1990 and Taoiseach, at that moment the youngest ever, um, from 1994 to 1997, where he headed a rainbow coalition of Fianna Gael, Labour and the Democratic Left. As Taoiseach, John called for constitutional reform to allow divorce in Ireland. He also um, launched the Anglo-Irish Framework document with the Prime, British Prime Minister John Major that proposed new relations between um, Ireland, Northern Ireland and the UK. He presided over the first official visit by a member of the British Royal Family to Ireland since 1912. That was um, Prince Charles. And he also presided over the Irish Presidency of the EU in 1996, where the Stability and Growth Pact was finalised. A strong European, um, John was chosen in 2001 as one of the two representatives of the Irish Parliament to the European Convention, which drafted the draft um, European Constitution. He also sat on the 12-member presidium of that body. He accepted an offer to become the EU ambassador to the EU in 2004, which he held for a, a five-year term. John has been outspoken on the subject of Brexit. Tonight he'll share his thoughts with us. The title of his lecture is Brexit, reversing a thousand years of history between these islands. John, it's a pleasure. We're delighted to have you. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> well, I suppose it's a truism to say that Ireland is more affected by what happens in the UK than is any other country in the world. This is due to the fact that Ireland is the host to the UK's only land border with another state. Geographically, the easiest route for Ireland to the Eurasian landmass is through UK territory. And politically, Ireland has been intertwined with the UK for most of the last millennium, including to this day under the mutual treaty obligations we and the UK share under the Belfast Agreement of 1998. So it's important for citizens of my state to understand what's going on and why is surprised by the UK decision to leave the European Union. Uh, the, uh, the, the Irish people were shocked. But before going into that, let me say a word about what the EU is and what it is not. The EU is not a state and is not about to be common. It is instead a habit of consultation and common action between states, underpinned by legal and institutional arrangements and obligations. These arrangements are evolving in response to needs as they arise. More than it is a legal structure, the EU is a habit of mind. That's what a political institution is, a habit of thinking together. Ireland will remain within that EU institution with 
some influence on its evolution. UK will not, which is unfortunate. I say this is unfortunate because the security of much of Ireland's infrastructure is dependent on links through the UK and its territorial waters. The sea is no longer the barrier to hostile forces that it was in 1939, in 1804, or in 1745. Increased global interdependence has brought increased vulnerability. Close and well-structured relations with one's near neighbours across the sea is important, increasingly important indeed, to the security of any island state, whether that be the island of Britain or Ireland. by the UK decision. It seemed the decision was taken without any regard to the effect it might have in either part of Ireland or on the peace of the island. But the shock was all the greater because the decision seemed to have been taken without a clearly articulated plan for the new relationship that the UK would have with the EU or for that matter with its closest neighbour, Ireland. Given our own experience with the referenda, this struck us as reckless. Taking an irrevocable decision on principle, without first negotiating what it might mean in practice, is like a pilot taking off without a flight path. Incidentally, this is also why I have reservations about the drafting of the provisions in the Belfast Agreement of 1998 for calling a referendum on Irish unity. It could simply put the cart before the horse again. U the UK voters uh, did agree to take back control from the EU in 2016, but without an agreed project for using the control they were taking back. Even now, five years after the decision, the plan is not yet visible. It was the more elderly section of the UK electors that were strongest in their support for leaving the European Union in the recent referendum. This was surprising to me because these were the very electors who were old enough to have had a vote in the 1975 referendum when they decided the UK should remain. How to explain this? Perhaps the UK was never comfortable being associated with continental Europe, even in 1975. Churchill favoured a United States of Europe, but with Britain staying aside from it. Churchill's successor as Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, wanted free trade with Europe. But initially, he wanted no part of a customs union and no political union. He did not believe, in fact, that the common market, when it was launched in 1957 by six countries without Britain, he did not believe it would work. But it did work. Meanwhile, the UK lost its empire, its links with the Commonwealth were weakening, the Suez debacle of 1956 reminded it that its alliance with the US was not based on equality. So in 1961, Macmillan changed his mind and made what he called at the time the grim choice to join the common market, only to have the application vetoed by Charles de Gaulle. De Gaulle felt that Britain was too close to the United States and was not wholehearted in its commitment to Europe. He wasn't wrong on the latter point. Eventually, another Conservative Prime Minister, Edward Heath, did succeed in persuading France to allow the UK to join the European communities. It is important now to recall what the British people were told in the 1970s about what joining the common market would mean. 
Many Brexit supporters have reached or wanted to join a common market in 1975. This is simply not so. Edward Heath, who had fought in the Second World War himself, told the House of Commons in April 1975 that the European communities were founded for a political purpose. The political purpose was to absorb the new Germany into the structure of the European family. Those are the words of Edward Heath, the Prime Minister. So the political goal was not hidden, and the British people formally accepted continued EU membership on that basis in their 1975 referendum. Gradually, the United Kingdom had come around to the view that it should not stand aside from the going, growing common endeavour of the common market slash European Union. As the newly appointed Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, put it in a speech she made in Luxembourg in October 1979, and I'm quoting directly, Britain could not turn away from a voluntary association designed to express the principles of Western democracy. Nor, she said, could any enterprise properly claim the proud name of Europe that did not include Britain. She continued, it took the British the whole of the 1950s to realize these simple truths. It took the six, six common market members, the whole of the 1960s to respond. These words of Margaret Thatcher suggest that at last, in 1970, Britain was comfortable of the European Britain's attitude. To the European Union. What happened to undo the lessons that the UK had, according to Mrs. Thatcher, learned in the 1950s? On the surface, four issues led UK public opinion to turn away from the European Union. The rows about the UK's financial contribution from 1979 onwards, the ejection of the pound sterling from the European monetary system, immigration to the interaction of free movement, the free movement provisions of the EU treaties, which have been there from the outset, and the EU's enlargement to include poorer countries from post-communist Europe, which Britain had indeed supported. And finally, the upsurge in identity politics in the wake of the financial crash of 2008. These reasons contributed to Britain's growing scepticism about the European Union. But I think there were deeper and longer lasting reasons than these. The memory of the First and Second World War had faded and was continuing to fade. The importance of maintaining a structure of peace and interdependence in Europe slowly diminished in the public mind in Britain. Communism was no longer a threat. Indeed, there is some evidence for the suggestion that long periods of peace encourage peoples to indulge in separatism. One can perhaps even see this within the UK itself at the moment. UK solidarity was greatest during the world wars and diminished slowly after they were over. So after all, synthetic and imperfect creations that subject to change. I think England's self-image also played a part in the discomfort that developed with the European Union. Britain sees itself, as, for, as Shakespeare put it, as a fortress built by nature for herself, as a sceptered isle surrounded by seas controlled by Britain. The religious divisions of the 16th century underlined this sense of separateness. Roman jurisdiction over the king's marriage was rejected. 
This religious dimension was reinforced by the fact that Britain's main continental rivals over three centuries up to 1900 were Catholic powers, Spain and France. And Britain was emphatically Protestant. Legally, it still is. From the 19, 1760s to the mid 20th century, Britain had the world's biggest empire. And let us not forget that the empire stood with Britain in 1940, when France had been defeated. America was neutral and Russia was not involved and was on the sidelines. For this valid reason, the Commonwealth still has an emotional appeal in Britain out of all proportion to its present political or economic importance. The monarchy also gave Britain a sense of self-confidence and an emotional bond that makes compromise with European neighbours, including with Ireland, seem just a little less necessary. These factors were when the British leave it. So the different decisions on those two occasions remain puzzling to outsiders like me. Turning now to the more to the recent negotiation of Britain's exit. The organizing principle of Brexit from a UK perspective seems to me to have been the restoration of untrammeled sovereignty to the Westminster Parliament, or at least to the government appointed with the confidence of the Westminster Parliament and to it only. For the UK, sovereignty must reside in one place and only in one place. Even the minutest issue, such as the health standards for plants and the safety and content of food must be decided in Westminster or Whitehall only and not in common with Brussels. This concern with indivisible sovereignty over plant standards and veterinary standards is the only reason the UK has declined to have a plant and veterinary standards agreement with the European Union. And that is the reason we have problems with supplies to garden centres and supermarkets in Northern Ireland through the outworking of the agreed protocol on Ireland. Sovereignty is everything and trumps everything. Well, in this thinking, of course, if sovereignty cannot be dedicated upwards to an international treaty-based organization like the European Union, it is also difficult to conceive of it being delegated downwards internally to the nations within the UK itself. Sovereignty and devolution in a sense only battles. Gordon Brown, the former prime minister, claimed in a Guardian article last year that it would soon be impossible to hold together a UK of nations and regions in the straight jacket, jacket of a centralized state, he said. His main criticism was that the UK government was taking decisions, like setting the terms for Brexit, without properly and formally taking into account the views of the devolved parliaments in Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast. Two of these had already stated that they wanted to stay in the EU single market, but the Westminster government ignored them. It was guided by, instead by the opinion of English MPs. These contradictions are profound and enduring. In a speech in which she spoke of the precious, of the precious union of the four nations, the then Prime Minister, Theresa May, also in the same speech announced that the UK would leave both the customs union and the single market something to which two of the four nations were opposed. Later, she felt free to go outside the long settled Barnett formula for dividing up finance between the devolved administrations, so she could give an extra one billion pounds to Northern Ireland in return for the support of the DUP for her government in Westminster. 
She only showed the devolved administration the text of her Article 50 letter, initiating UK withdrawal from the EU on the very day she sent the letter to Brussels. The European Union operates according to a written rulebook, the Lisbon Treaty, which is a sort of constitution, which is interpreted by a single court system. In effect, on the other hand, the UK Union has only one rule, Westminster decides. The durability of this arrangement will be tested in the future. The EU will also be tested in coming years. Many advocates of Brexit in the UK saw Brexit as loosening the unity of the EU. That has not actually happened. In fact, the fiscal integration of the EU has deepened since the UK left. Even though there have been policy failures in the EU, as on vaccination, the unity of the EU has not weakened. Indeed, some of the supposedly anti-EU parties in Italy and France have actually modified their position in a more favourable direction to the EU. That's not what the Daily Telegraph expected. But let us wait and see. In politics, being deceived is no excuse. Who won the Brexit trade negotiation? In fact, the fact that there is any agreement at all after the brinkmanship and bad blood that preceded the agreement is a tribute to all involved, including the British negotiators. It is in the nature of a divorce like Brexit that both sides actually lose. That may be a calculated choice. First, let's look in asking the question who did best in the negotiations at the British side. For them, the goal was sovereignty. While traditionally sovereignty has been seen as the unfettered power of British parliaments to legislate, Boris Johnson has interpreted as taking it as taking back into the hands of British ministers the power in question rather to Parliament itself. From a British point of view, <coughs> the agreement goes a good way towards meeting this goal of re-establishing sovereignty. British ministers have taken back control, at least on paper, of many issues, at least as far as the island of Britain is concerned, but not as far as Northern Ireland is concerned. This is because UK voters in 2016 simply forgot about Northern Ireland and ignored the problems of the UK's land border there with the European Union. They were reassured by their leaders that there would be no problem, but as the Polish philosopher Lecek Kolakowski said, in politics, being deceived is no excuse. Future EU rules in which neither the UK nor the people of Northern Ireland nor their elected representatives will have had a direct or indirect say will continue to apply in Northern Ireland under the protocol the UK Parliament agreed with the EU in its haste to get out the door as quickly as possible. In sum, Boris Johnson and the UK Parliament have traded more UK sovereignty over the island of Britain for less UK sovereignty over Northern Ireland. In future, the more British rules diverge from EU rules, the more will Northern Ireland diverge from the rest of the United Kingdom. And more divergence is the declared goal EU government. The Ireland unionists could be quite destabilizing if the UK government, in order to justify Brexit, decides to diverge radically from the EU on trade and regulatory matters. In a letter to 
EU leaders last year, Boris Johnson, said that British laws would diverge from those of the EU. And he added, that is the point of our exit. And our ability to enable this, that is more divergence, is central to our future democracy. Those are his words. Divergence from the EU is central to the future of British democracy, according to the Prime Minister. Where will that leave Northern Ireland under the terms of the protocol he signed and which was endorsed on his recommendation by Parliament? The joint EU-UK committee set up under the withdrawal agreement will need to, to monitor the political and security consequences of this rush, rush to diverge almost for its own sake. Title 10 of the agreement does require advance notice and consultations of changes in regulations as between the UK and the EU. It would be important for peace and security that these consultations include representatives of all major interests in Northern Ireland. That said, the agreement contains significant gains for the UK side, at least as far as the island of Britain is concerned. Firstly, there will be no direct application of decisions of the European Court of Justice on the island of Britain. Secondly, while the UK accepted social, environmental and quality standards, it will be free to set its own UK standards for the island of Britain. These will, as I have said, be different from those applying in Northern Ireland and in the European Union. The right to diverge is what Brexit here saw as an expression of UK sovereignty, and they've got it. But thirdly, the UK does accept that divergence will not come for free. As one advocate of Brexit, Dr. Ian Fox put it in Westminster during the debate on the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. He said, if we want access to the single market, there will be a price to be, pay, to be paid. If we want to diverge from the rules of the single market, there will be a price to be paid. The agreement established detailed mechanisms to negotiate the price that will have to be paid mostly by consumers in the form of higher prices for divergence. This will be going on and on and on for years to come. These mechanisms of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, a partnership council, joint committees and arbitra arbitration tribunals are completely untested at this stage. A great deal will depend on the particular use the UK decides to make of the new freedoms it has obtained. If problems arise, and these cannot be settled in the committee system, there is an agreed provision for arbitration, three-person arbitration tribunals, which will operate on strict time limits, will be set up. If the arbitrators find that either the EU or the UK has breached the agreed principles, the other party will be allowed to impose prohibitions or restrictions to compensate for losses that have been suffered. Incidentally, these tariffs, if imposed, will have to be paid on goods going from Britain to Northern Ireland or vice versa. But this aspect of the agreement, on the other hand, is valuable from an EU point of view. In the absence of such a system for tribunals, any disputes would have had to be referred to this disputes regulation system of the WTO. The WTO system is both cumbersome and narrow. Parties, parties before the WTO can stall, adopt delaying tactics, or just ignore rulings. Disputes can drag on there for years, as we've seen with the US-EU dispute about subsidies to Boeing and Airbus. So uh, reaching agreement on a customized EU-UK disputes regulation mechanism was an important achievement for Michel Garnier and indeed for Lord Frost. 
But there are downsides in the agreement for the EU too. The EU will be replacing a single set of rules interpreted by a single judicial authority, the European Court of Justice, with individual arbitration tribunals operating under tight deadlines. This could lead to inconsistent decisions in different areas of trade. If a tribunal interprets EU law differently to the interpretation later placed by the European Court of Justice on the same issue, there could be real difficulties. The UK will, of course, also be free to negotiate trade agreements of its own with non-EU countries. These negotiations may create additional pressure for even more divergence between the UK and EU and the EU standards. The UK may come under pressure to allow imports to the UK that would not meet EU standards. For example, the UK may come under pressure to accept chlorine washed chicken, hormone treated beef, or foods that have been genetically modified. If these products are then incorporated into processed foods, which are then exported to the European Union, there could be big problems. We've had food quality scares in the past. And we know how powerful they can be in public opinion. There are also separate and detailed provisions for imports that could upset the playing field, the supposed level of playing field on which EU and British producers will compete. And there are procedures where both sides can complain and get remedies in respect of that. In global terms, we've got to admit, the continent of Europe has been weakened by Brexit. So Brexit will force the European Union to up its game. As a single entity, the UK will be able to move more quickly to set new regulations for new sectors based on the technologies of the future. The EU, on the other hand, with 27 members to satisfy and a budget of only 1% of GDP may move more slowly. This deficiency must be addressed by the European Union for its own sake. I hope that the Conference on the Future of Europe meeting indeed for the first time this week to streamline EU decisions amendments to the Lisbon Treaties. A union that is unable to amend its constitution eventually gets into trouble as the United States of America is increasingly fighting. And now, move to, to conclude my lecture by referring to the issue of possible unity polls in Ireland. Although legally speaking, the issues are unconnected, Brexit has led to speculation that there might soon be a poll under the terms of the Belfast Agreement of 1998 on Irish unity. The agreement says that there should be such a poll if the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland believes such a poll would result in a vote for Irish unity. It assumes that there would also be a poll in the rest of Ireland as well. The rest the relevant text of the agreement is as follows. The Secretary of State shall exercise the power under paragraph one that's to call a poll on unity if at any time it appears to him likely that a majority of those voting would express a wish that Northern Ireland should cease to be part of the United Kingdom and form part of a united Ireland. That's what the treaty says. A majority, however, for this major decision could be as little as 50.5% as against 49.5%. According to some of those present in the final days of Holy Week of 1998, in the negotiation of the Belfast Agreement, the organization of 
were not much considered by Northern Ireland since 1920 demonstrates the danger of attempting to impose by a simple majority a constitutional settlement and an identity on a minority who feel they have been overruled. If, for example, 49.5% majority minor, if, if, sorry, if, for example, 49.5% minority in Northern Ireland, having voted to stay in the United Kingdom and resolutely rejecting rule from Dublin, find that they have been overruled by a 50.5% majority, one could expect there would be difficulties, not least for the government in Dublin. A poll in those circumstances could repeat the error of 1920 and add to divisions rather than diminish them. I was a bit surprised, therefore, to see Bertie Ahern, one of the negotiators of the Belfast Agreement and a former Taoiseach, call for the border polls to take place in 2028, which is the 30th anniversary of the Belfast Agreement. Target dates tend to be misinterpreted as promises. A sense of inevitability takes over once the target is set. Opinion becomes polarised and rational discussion of the risks becomes next to impossible. Reducing a complex issue with many nuances and gradations to an oversimplified yes, no question is risky anyway. And deciding such a matter by a referendum irrevocably without first negotiating the details is not wise. It can lead to unforeseen results. That is perhaps a lesson of the 2016 Brexit referendum that the Irish people could take to heart in respect of their own future. Strangely, the Belfast Agreement does not require the UK government to consult with the Irish government before calling such a unity poll, even though a poll on the same subject would have to take place in the Irish Republic too, and both would have to vote in the same direction. The result of such a poll could have major financial, security and cultural consequences for the Republic of Ireland. This omission of consulting the Irish government uh, in the Good Friday Agreement gives weight to the suggestion that this part of the agreement was not examined in depth by the negotiators in 1998. Even though all other legislative decisions inside Northern Ireland must under the same Belfast Agreement be agreed by a procedure of parallel consent of both nationalists and unionists, this possibly irrevocable existential decision on sovereignty could be made by a simple majority of as little as a single vote by a single citizen in a referendum. This may be the law but it sits uneasily behind the principles set out in the agreement itself, which say that the parties will, and I quote, endeavour to strive in every practical way towards reconciliation and rapprochement of a democratic and agreed arrangement. It seeks something agreed rather than something decided by a simple majority. Deciding the biggest question of all by a simple majority runs up against the principles of the Downing Street Declaration of 1993, agreed by Albert Reynolds, Taoiseach and John Major as Prime Minister, which are the foundation for the peace process. That Downing Street Declaration said that Irish unity should be achieved, and I quote, by those who favour it, persuading those who do not, peacefully and without coercion or violence. This type of persuasion of the opposite community is not taking place in Northern Ireland at the moment, in either a pro-union or a pro-United Ireland direction. Thanks to Brexit, positions are now more polarised 
than ever. The Downing Street Declaration of 1993, and Taoiseach Albert said on behalf of the Irish people, I quote again, stability will not be found under any agreement, or sorry, stability will not be found under any system which has refused allegiance or rejected on grounds of identity by a significant minority of those governed by it. Let us face facts. A poll on unity carried by a narrow majority, say 51 to 49, could not be guaranteed to deliver a system that would not be at risk of being rejected on grounds of identity by a significant minority, to use that with wise words. The consent of the government governed is an essential ingredient of stability. Irish unity carried by a 51-49% margin might not obtain the requisite consent of the defeated 49%, who would still have to be governed under it. This, that's practical politics. So I say that peace and stability, tolerance and gradualism should be our guiding principles in approaching the question of sovereignty over Northern Ireland. The focus should be on making all three stand, strands of the Good Friday Agreement. The strand north-south, the strand within Northern Ireland, and the strand between Ireland and Britain. To make all three strands yield their full potential, which they are not doing at the moment. The east-west between Britain and Ireland strand is not working at all. The north-south strand is working only minimally, and the internal Northern Ireland strand is staggering from crisis to crisis. We must build sustained reconciliation and shared goals between the two communities in Northern Ireland before considering sovereignty issues. That is a common sense precondition for success of any of the many constitutional options that might be considered for Northern Ireland at some stage in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. That was that was great. Very wide ranging and um, and sobering. Um, there are a lot of questions coming in via um, the Q and A button, and I've collected a number of them, and I'll put them to you. Um, I'll put some of them to you in a moment. But I wondered if I could ask you whether you were surprised um, by the neglect of the Irish board as an issue in the run up to the referendum, and what that said to you about the sort of habit of cooperation between Dublin and London, which presumably had grown up after the, um, the Belfast Good Friday um, Agreement. Um, and if you could give us a kind of insight into the way that the, the UK-Ireland um, relationship worked in the sort of margins of the, um, of the European Council, for example, were there sort of routines of discussion between sort of you know, friendly neighbours um, and you know, what, it, what it said to you that, um, that this was being completely overlooked during the course of the referendum campaign? Well. Since uh, Northern Ireland was established 100 years ago, there have been very long periods in which the sovereign power paid virtually no attention to what was going on in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. from, the, from the mid 1920s right up to the late 1960s, uh, there was no attention being paid to what was going on by the government in London. Uh, there was never a member of parliament from Northern Ireland sitting as a member of any UK government over that long period. Uh, and there was little interest taken. Then, unfortunately, as a result of first peaceful agitation for civil rights, which achieved its goal, which was then exploited by violent republicanism, the goals having already been achieved by peaceful means, that violence did get the attention of Westminster. And during the uh, 1980s, 
and 1990s, there was a very high level of attention paid, uh, not just to Northern Ireland, but to Ireland as a whole, by governments uh, in, in London. This was partly the result of intense diplomatic effort by the Irish Embassy in London, uh, meeting individual MPs and explaining Ireland to them, reminding people in Britain that there were solutions to the problems and the divisions in Ireland, which needed active British intellectual engagement. And that resulted eventually in the uh, Belfast, in the Anglo-Irish Agreement of the 1985, and then in the Belfast Agreement or Good Friday Agreement of 1998. And it continued thereafter as well, because the agreement uh, was made, but the institutions weren't working very well until uh, into the well into the 21st century. But once the arrangements were up and running. I think there was a tendency in London simply to forget. And indeed, when it came to the Brexit decision, I think most people in Britain forgot that in fact, Britain was going to have a border with the European Union, a physical land border, 300 miles long, very difficult to police. Uh, and that issue wasn't addressed in the Brexit referendum. Now, I, I remember appearing before a committee of the House of Lords and I was asked, was Brexit going to lead to an upsurge in smuggling? Uh, so some Lords did remember that there was a border there, uh, which would be a much deeper border once Britain left the EU. Uh, but generally it didn't figure uh, in, in the debate, which, which really did uh, surprise me and I, I think it shows that if you're going to have a family referendums, you want to make absolutely sure that the public are extremely well. Hello. Yeah, sorry, John. We lost you for quite quite a long time. There's a bit of a there's some interference on your on your um in, on your connection. Okay. Um, can I ask a, an, an, another another question? Which is, I wondered what the impact on public opinion in Ireland had been of the referendum result. Um, I haven't. I understand that Ireland's never had a particularly strong element of sort of Euroscepticism in any of its political parties. How was that? Um, did that change at all? Was there any impact on public opinion or, or party competition um, as a result of Brexit? Well, uh, Ireland uh, is very enthusiastic about being a member of the European Union. Uh, and I think we're enthusiastic for, for a number of reasons. Uh, not least the fact that, like many small countries, we see being part of a bigger union as a way of being able to protect our own interests uh, and not be overshadowed by a very large neighbour. In our case, the very large neighbour is uh, Britain. In Belgium's case, it's France. Uh, it, it, there are many countries in Europe that benefit, as Ireland does, from being in the European Union by virtue of, of that opportunity to um, not be left alone, so to speak, uh, with uh, an entity that is uh, pursuing its own agenda and may not always be paying attention to, to the interests of its smaller neighbour. Great, thank you. Um, just, I'm going to read, read a message from um, David Campbell Ban Bannerman, that, who's on who's online, and he he says, "Mr. Bruton, I stood behind you and John Major when the peace process started in 1996 as special advisor to Sir Patrick Mayhew. I salute you for the vital role you played in that process. The Good Friday Agreement has become a model for the world, handy for the Middle East?" Question mark exclamation mark. Um, so, thank you, it's David. A, it's very uh, very good to hear that, and to, indeed to hear it from somebody with such a distinguished historic name. 
I've got um, a number of um, questions that, that, that relate to, mainly to the UK, so I'm going to stick on the Ireland ones um, for the for the moment. I'm, I'm going to move back out of the sun here. Go on. Okay. I think I'm. Can you still see me? Yeah, can see you. So, so one question is whether you whether you consider that the sort of English establishment still sees um, the island of Ireland as its back door, which we take for granted in in politics and international affairs. I don't. I you know I wouldn't say that. I I, I think um, I, I think Britain obviously is a much bigger country than Ireland. It has a huge range of global interests. Uh, it has associations with countries that were formerly part or are part of its commonwealth or formerly part of its empire. Uh, so Ireland is just one of the countries that it has to deal with. But I think what Britain forgets is that Ireland is by far the nearest neighbour that Britain has. And in proportionate terms, per capita, and by far the most important. And I think uh, as one looks to the horizon sometimes in London, one forgets what's straight in front of you. Let me ask um, some, uh, there's some, there's some questions about um, the negotiations and the relationship between the, U the UK and the EU. And there's a sort of emerging um, sort of stream of questions here about um, whether the EU could have done more in trying to um, reach an agreement with the, the UK before Brexit. So a specific question about whether enough was done with the, um, with the Cameron um, negotiation of the, of, the, of the new settlement, um, whether more could have been done in the, in the, nego in the negotiations themselves to have arrived at a better deal for, um, for both sides. I just wondered what you what you thought about that. Well, I think the one the one issue which one hears most frequently uh, put forward as the one on which the EU EU might have made more concessions to David Cameron is on restricting uh, free movement of people within the European Union uh, because British people felt that they were perhaps having more of the uh, EU immigrants coming to Britain and we're going to other EU countries, coming from countries like Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, and so on. But I think there are two things that I think those critics uh, don't give adequate weight to. One is that Britain was in the lead in seeking to have the EU enlarged the East and to have these countries brought in. And Britain did so in the knowledge that one of the provisions of the EU is the movement, the, for, the freedoms of the European Union, the freedom to move capital, uh, to move goods, and to move people from one country to the other and work in any part of the Union. And Britain was essentially asking that, that one of those freedoms would be removed in order to persuade British people to stay. Um, and that was at a time when, in fact, uh, although pe people were coming into Britain from the EU under the freedom of movement provisions of the European Union, Britain itself was already letting in an even larger number of people from other parts of the world uh, by a decision of the British Home Secretary himself or herself. So I think the EU found it a bit odd that the focus as far as immigration was concerned was on EU immigration rather than on immigration in general. And also the feeling I think was that immigration in general is a good thing. It enriches uh, people. I mean, British people over the centuries have emigrated all over the world and made themselves welcome in other countries. Uh, so it was felt that you know, the concern about immigration was something that perhaps British politicians should have been able to deal with themselves without making it an EU issue in the negotiation. Um, 
I, I, I must say, I know, I, I, I mean, it, possibly we could have done other things, but I, I, given I think that I had said this in my speech, the reasons that were underlying the British reluctance about Europe were not really about specifics like the financial contribution or immigration. They were a sort of a matter of the spirit, the British spirit or the British sense of itself was of a separate island, a separate polity. And I think to some extent that was more an English thing than a British thing. I don't think that was felt in Scotland. I don't think it was felt in Northern Ireland. It was felt to some degree in Wales. <clears throat> It might, it might be a bit unfair to ask you this question, but it's being uh, asked a lot um, in, in various forms in the in the Q and A, and that's about how you see the um, United Kingdom as a union of states. Um, do you do you think that this this is a, a union that's now um, under strain? Do you think there's any any um, alternative models that could, um, of, of governance in the UK that could be that could be tried? Um, and um, to to you know, perhaps you might not want to speculate on. On, on the UK, but um, but another, another sort of another variation of this question is: Do you think it would be advantageous to Ireland if Scotland leaves the UK and joins the EU as an independent country? Well, I, in general, it's in Ireland's interest that there be the maximum degree of stability on our neighbouring island. Mm -hmm. It is not in our interests to see our neighbour. Uh, diverted from economic development and moved in the direction of instability. That said, I think, and I did advert this to this sort of obliquely in my remarks, I think there are deficiencies in the UK Union uh, which could be remedied and could indeed be remedied by looking at how the European Union operates. The European Union has a, a, so to speak, a written constitution in the form of the, the, the treaties, the Lisbon treaties. Those treaties are not fixed in stone, they're capable of, of being amended. And they say what are the powers of the Union and they say that everything else shall be the power of the member states. Now, I think there could be arguments for the UK looking at the idea of having some sort of a, a, a constitution or written document or understanding uh, convention, sort of a Magna Carta for the Union that set out what are the rights of Scotland, what are the rights of England, what are the rights of Wales, what are the rights of Northern Ireland. What are the rights that the UK as a whole has to over those four nations? And what may the UK as a whole not do, not be allowed to do to the detriment of those nations? To have all that as far as possible written down. Now, that won't end all argument. There will still be litigation, there will still be disputes and there'll be arguments and there'll be court cases and all of that. But at least, there, will, there would be, in that scenario, a minimum set of rights that the Union as a whole would have, and a minimum set of rights that each of the constituent parts, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, would have. Now, it wouldn't be an easy document to draft, um, and there would be you know, disagreements. I mean, some, some of the constituent parts might feel that the union should be a confederal union where a part could decide to leave at some stage in the future. Others might say that the union should be a federal union where a part could not leave. Um, and the, the United States weren't, weren't too clear which they were in 1860 until it was decided by the result of war. Um, so these are not easy issues. I'm not pretending uh, that they're going to be easily solved. But I, if I were, if I were 
advising uh, the uh, UK government, I'd be looking at that area rather than looking at this issue in the binary way. Who has sovereignty? All the sovereignty in London, and that's it. You know, like looking at issues in terms of absolute untrammeled sovereignty, which is the traditional English way of looking at the issue, I admit, isn't necessarily the most productive way of dealing with a union as diverse as the United Kingdom is. Um, there are a few questions about the Irish border. Um, one is a very practical one, and that comes from um, David Campbell Bannerman. And, and again, he, he wonders whether the, the checks at the border are excessive, bureaucratic, risk, risking endangering the whole Northern Ireland protocol. Um, notes that um, the um, norm, normal checks are just you know way, way of what, they would, what they would be. The, the checks are what they way of what they would be normally. Um, they seem over the top um, to him. And he, 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 um, there's a court case next week, and we just wonder whether um, the Good Friday Agreement test of consultation may fail, in which case he asks, how likely is it that Article 16 will be invoked and the protocol has to be um, renegotiated? Um, so that's, that's, one, that's one question. There's a question which is, um, that's quite hypothetical, I suppose, but there's a question that's even more hypothetical, which is, what, what, would, what, what would Ireland's response have been if the UK had gone for no deal and the EU had asked the Republic to erect a north-south um, border, would that have been, um, is that what, what Ireland would have had to do? Well, if the UK decided to go for no deal, we would have had to do that. We would have had to have a border because uh, we're part of the EU single market. And, the, and this goes to answer the first part of the question as well. The, the EU has a very detailed customs code, uh, which, was drafted with the involvement of the UK as an EU member, which goes into immense detail about the checks that have to be carried out at the border, on what and by whom. And it's not a simple document. And we've known from the very beginning that checks along those lines would have to be uh, conducted somewhere. Now, Given the fragility of peace in Ireland, and given the practicality of trying to exercise all those controls along a 300 mile long border route, I think it's 200 different crossing points. Um, I think the more practical way of exercising the controls and minimizing the cost of the controls is to conduct them at sea. Now, I would have preferred, I have to say, if the controls that are now going to occur under the Ireland Protocol at sea were much less. And they would be much less if, as I pointed out in my remarks, Britain had been prepared to give up just a little sovereignty and agree, for example, to a plant and veterinary treaty with the European Union where we had common standards, then there would be no need for checks. Products from the centres and something or, or vice versa. But unfortunately, because Britain put such a priority on sovereignty, we have to have far more controls than I would regard as desirable. And I also would draw attention to the fact that the current British Prime Minister has stated that he wants even more divergence. He said, as I quoted in my remarks, divergence is the whole point of Brexit. Well, the more divergence Britain has, the more isolated will Northern Ireland be from the rest of the UK. And that would be, if it happens, a deliberate UK choice be made by a UK government in full knowledge of what the rules are. Rules which the EU, which, sorry, which the UK had had a part in making and it was in the EU. You, you, um, you finished um, your talk with a discussion of um, the, the possibility and the conditions of um, Irish unification. And um, 
I know there's a number of polls been um, conducted in, um, in Ireland about about that. Um, do you think um, that the South, um, or I should I say, do you think that Ireland wants unification? Um, is that is that um, the direction of political travel currently? Is that how how public opinion envisages things? I think that there was a there was a poll that um, that Katie Hayward reported recently, I believe, which said um, which had people sort of evenly split, but then said, um, but actually most people anticipate this will happen in the next 10 or 15 years. I wondered what your view was. I don't think uh, it's internally reconciled um, for it to make a decision on this issue. Um, that would bring enough people along. Now, I'm not talking about the legal requirement. A bare majority of one vote in a referendum is enough to bring about Irish unity. But would that be wise if there was a very, very large, very determined minority who didn't want it? Uh, the whole lesson of Northern Ireland history is that attempting to impose an arrangement on a minority in this case, it was the nationalist minority in Northern Ireland over 60 years. That didn't work and led to a lot of trouble. Well, doing the same in reverse, uh, imposing Irish unity on a large minority in Northern Ireland would be equally reckless. Mm. And I, I think that whatever the Good Friday Agreement says, the overriding value, the overriding goal has to be peace and stability on the island of Ireland for everybody. Uh, and uh, it's within that sort of context that we can gradually come closer together through education, reforms, through other things to release the potential of Northern Ireland. And while I can fully understand the reservations that people have in Northern Ireland if they're unionists, about the protocol. And I, I laid those out in my remarks because I think people need to understand this is not easy for Northern Unionists, what's happening. On the other hand, the protocol does have significant potential upsides. Good place to locate a business. If you and the European Union market. The ideal place in the entire world to locate such a business is Northern Ireland, because you have free access to the EU across the border in Ireland with no controls, and you have free access to the British market, uh, at the UK market. That's a huge opportunity, which I think business people in Northern Ireland fully realize, but politicians, because Unfortunately, like American politicians, they're trying to bring their most extreme supporters along with them rather than looking for the middle ground. Politicians don't talk about the opportunities. Uh, now, I'm not saying that the protocol was designed to give Northern Ireland special opportunities that would be given to nobody else. That was not the motive. Uh, it would be dishonest to pretend that it was. But the protocol does nonetheless create an opportunity for Northern Ireland, which in my view it should take, because it's not going to be able to change the vote. Do you think that's widely appreciated in Northern Ireland? I mean, this was no. a question that was that was raised, um, that, that actually that it is in, it does occupy a rather fortuitous position for, for exactly the reasons you've just described. I, I don't think it, it is realised, and indeed uh, Arlene Foster initially, when the, when the protocol was published, drew attention to this opportunity. But um, she didn't survive uh, because uh, when the streets began to agitate, she changed her position and said she wanted to rid of the protocol. Uh, and well, we are where we are now. But in, 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 my, in, in my view, um, there has to be a border somewhere. Brexit is about building a border. Brexit is about taking back control. in your borders so somewhere as a result of the UK decision to have Brexit. 
Uh, and the question is where that border is going to be. The protocol says it can be done at sea, and in the process of doing it at sea, you give Northern Ireland opportunities that it wouldn't, that no one, nowhere else in the world would have. Um, I think, while it's not ideal, uh, it's something that I think Northern Unionists should embrace. And we want, we want Northern Ar Unionists to be happy and content. We have no interest in discontent among the Unionist population in Northern Ireland. That is not in our interest. Um, one, one of the uh, members of the audience um, um, missed chunks of your lectures because um, there, there was a bit of an issue with the, um, with the internet, although I'd like to remind everybody that, um, that a full transcript will be available and made, made, made available in the coming days. Um, but um, the, the question here is specifically about what you meant by your, the title of your lecture about reversing history. Is it as simple as unification on an island country independent from Britain, whatever that turns out to be? Well, I'm not so sure what I meant by the title, actually. It was more a whimsy, really, to try and get people interested. Um, and I, I don't think I've actually answered the question in the course of the lecture, even though it was a long lecture. But I think the truth of the matter is that uh, Ireland and Britain have been interchanged, inter intertwined with one another. But we've all successively successively been intertwined with the French, with the Danes, with the Vikings. Uh, you know, we, we've been existing together in Northwestern Europe. Uh, arrangement right up to the Reformation and common uh, political arrangements for much of our history as well. Uh, and for those reasons, I think we should be maximizing integration rather than maximizing separation, which unfortunately, I think what Brexit is, is doing. I wonder if I could um, uh, sort of draw on your experience um, as EU ambassador to Washington as well. I wondered what you, you thought that the perspective from Washington on Brexit um, was and is, and um, the reflection on the power of the UK would be. Um, I mean, presumably um, when, the, when the UK was a member of the EU, it was seen as um, Equal, have, having equal status to, to Germany and France, is it, um, has it been sort of downgraded, do you think, now in American eyes, or, or um, how, how do you think it's perceived from, um, from the US? Well, I have to say I never discussed that uh, while I was ambassador in Washington with any Americans. I didn't ask them, what do you think of the British? Uh, because I was representing the British when I was there, and Britain was a member of the European Union. And <clears throat> one of the things I had to do very often was uh, agitate on behalf of Lloyds of London uh, in the UK, in the American market, because uh, you know, the insurance is an EU responsibility. Um, and Britain has, I, I would say, the best diplomats in the world. Um, the, certainly the ambassadors that I served with, David Manning and Paul, um, were tremendous people. Uh, and when it came during the EU presidencies, when the British presidency took place and we had to represent Europe, it was the best presidency in America of the European Union, the British presidency. The professionalism, the way in which they presented Europe positively to Americans. Um, I think Britain will retain tremendous influence uh, in, 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 in Washington anyway. I'm not so sure, that, however, that Brexit is increasing Britain's influence. In fact, it's reduced slightly because uh, American statespeople are no longer going to turn to British uh, counterparts to accept, to help explain what's going on at the European Union. Because Britain won't be there. Uh, if they want to do it in English, they'll probably have to turn to the Irish. Uh, representatives who won't necessarily be as well informed on some is issues. And I think the, the relationship between, uh, between America and Paris and, and, and Berlin will probably become slightly greater. But this is only slight. I mean, the British security alliance with the United States is enormously important. 
Indeed, the British security umbrella is enormously important, period, uh, for us as well in Ireland uh, because of the seas we share. So I, I, won't, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Now, there is, uh, there is a sort of sentimental uh, interest in Ireland on the part of many people of Irish heritage in America. And they would not want Britain in the course of its Brexit work to do anything that would cause major trouble in Ireland. Um, but I, 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 I think that's something that Britain is, is, is well aware of. Uh, but I, I think it's a problem that is sort of solved by the protocol. If there were to be a question, wanted to introduce the same controls along the land border in Ireland as a substitute, then I think you'd have very big trouble with the Americans. Big, big trouble. Not just with the Europeans, not just with Ireland, but with the Americans as well. But I don't think that's going to happen. That, that was, that's an element of um, Irish diplomacy that's been really highlighted by a number of, um, of commentators like Bridget Laffan talking about uh, the, um, the, the, the sort of targeting not only of um, other um, EU capitals, but also of Washington and how effectively it was done. And um, um, I want to ask you something slightly different. Um, different um, and um, this is a bit of away from our subject, but it comes back to your, your experience in the US. Um, it's often said that, um, well, it was certainly said before the current, that the, the um, before Trump became president, that actually didn't matter who the incumbent was um, of the White House. And I just wondered what your experience of that was, um, as he, in, in the transition from Bush to Obama. Were you um, were you aware of a very profound difference, change in policy, um, or was it sort of you know, to a large extent business as usual? Um, the big difference was that the Bush, I, I, I served for four years of President Bush, George W. Bush, and one year of President Obama. In the first term of President Bush, when I wasn't in Washington, there was quite a bit of friction over the Iraq war and the fact that some European Union members were against that. However, by the time I got to Washington, that was sort of behind us. And the Bush administration wanted to talk with you. And I found it very easy to get people in the, in the National Security Council, people in the State Department to discuss European issues. When the Obama administration came in, it wasn't that they were less interested in Europe, but basically they had views about Europe that date back to the Clinton era, because they had they'd served in the Clinton administration and were not up to date, really, in the way that Europe had evolved. And also, of course, as happens with a new administration, a lot of the positions in the new administration were vacant. So it wasn't possible to get to see the person you should see because that person hadn't been appointed yet. So there was a bit of a slowing down in the intensity of the relationship with the United States in the early months of the Obama administration. But I've no doubt that that, you know, that was overcome. Uh, quite quickly. And I have no doubt also that the experience I've described from the perspective of the European Union would have been a similar experience uh, to the one of, of other states represented in Washington, including the UK. Interesting. I'm just waiting to see if any more questions are going to, um, to appear on the Q&A. Um, I think I've asked most of them. Um, I wonder if I could ask an another question, which is, do you think that in, in, um, in, the, in Irish eyes, has the reputation of the UK been 
damage as a consequence of the Brexit referendum and the negotiations and where we are now? Hey, yes, in the sense that uh, Britain is sort of making it up as it goes along, that there isn't a plan, that there are decisions being taken which seem good politically at the time and may indeed work very well, but that there isn't a sort of overall coherent sense of where Britain is, is going externally. No, I think the levelling up agenda, that makes a lot of sense. I think one of the lessons of, of the Brexit referendum that I didn't mention in my speech is that I think people voted against the European Union because they felt they were being neglected by their own government as much as by the European Union. Uh, and that's being addressed and that's important. But in, in the sense of where Britain wants to go globally, um, it's sort of one task at a time. At the moment, it's the climate uh, change discussion in Glasgow at the end of the year. That's absorbing all the attention, and that's good. That's Britain's job to do that. But you know, where does Britain? How does Britain see Northern Ireland? How does Britain see its relationship with Europe? How does Britain see Europe's relationship with China? How does Britain see? how Europe and Britain can work together uh, to help the people of Africa. Uh, there isn't a sense that, that these issues are being adequately engaged with. Uh, and I think for, you know, I do think definitely uh, the situation in Northern Ireland has been neglected quite seriously. Now that's, that is certainly affects our opinion in our, but, uh, but it's one of a number of issues that are probably you know, excess focus on Brexit and getting Brexit done, almost at the expense of everything else. With 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 no line with the, with sort of kind of political um, issues and sort of social unrest, I suppose that we're we're talking about. I mean, presumably this isn't somewhere where until the political will exists in London anything can be done. I just wondered what your view was. Well, I think a lot depends uh, on, on the person at the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. Mm. When Julian Smith was there, there was a feeling that there was someone who was really in charge and they had an idea of where he was going. Um, but he clearly didn't retain the confidence of the Prime Minister for whatever reason. Which, uh, and that's a great pity. And he was replaced. Uh, and I, I don't know, I get the sense, I don't know Brandon Lewis, but I get the sense that he's sort of waiting for Downing Street to decide that he doesn't have the bandwidth to make decisions himself, as Julian Smith did and got into trouble possibly for doing. Uh, and that, you know, that has created a major lacuna. Um, the Northern Ireland post in the UK government is a very important post. It's not a consolation prize. It's not a parking lot for somebody where they're waiting for something else. Um, it's potentially one of the most constitutionally important positions for the future of the UK. And it should be getting the best attention not just to the Prime Minister, but I think particularly of the Secretary of State and his or her ministers. They should be people Yes, um, Chris, we are working together. Um, I think this will have to be the final question and, uh, um, and that's one which asks, and um, we've already talked a bit about Euroscepticism in, in, in Ireland, um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a query, what would it take to create a popular Eurosceptic movement in Ireland? Well, I suppose you'd have to have a situation in which the EU was clearly not listening to Ireland. Um, 
And that's not been the case. Um, Irish people have you know, been in influential positions in the EU. We've had two secretaries general of the commission. We've had two EU ambassadors to Washington. We've had senior commission positions. We have a very small number of MEPs uh, who have a hard job to do, and we uh, we probably don't support them enough. But Ireland does, you know, keep its end up in Europe. Um, if it was felt that a major issue came up upon which Ireland was in the right and was being ignored, um, I think there could be a loss. Now, there will be decisions to be taken by the EU, which could be unpopular in Ireland. Uh, our tax code may be overhauled. But I think we are fairly confident that while we may not like the decision, the decision will probably be a fair decision and we'll probably have to accept it. There's another area where I think there could be difficulty and that is in regard to both fiscal policy and climate change. In both of these areas, we decided to appoint the European Union as the least of the two in order. Now, policemen are not always popular. And even though it is the EU governments that decided that the EU should have the job of setting targets for us, for our taxes and our finances and our greenhouse gas reductions, if the EU comes along and imposes a penalty on us for breaking the rules, even though we told them it was their job to enforce those rules, I think you could find that the Irish politicians are not explaining the thing as fairly as I've just explained it and just blame Brussels. Um, so you have to keep defending the European Union. The big problem I think in, in Britain was that British politicians over the last 45 years tended to blame Brussels rather than defend the common decisions of the European Union. And eventually that crisis had its working in the Brexit referendum. We must avoid the same. Thank you very much. Before um, we thank we thank you, um, can I just advertise our next event, which takes place in two weeks' time? It will be on a topic that many of you been, have been addressing in this um, in this with, well, via the chat function um, tonight. It's on the United Kingdom Brexit and the future of, of um, the Union. And here we um, will be de we're delighted to welcome KT Hayward. Professor of Political Sociology at Queen's University of Belfast, Nicola McEwen from the University of Edinburgh, and Dan Wincott from, um, from Cardiff University. So we'll be talking about that on the 25th of May, two weeks from today. But John, um, can I just thank you for what's been a fantastic, wide-ranging, really engaging and insightful um, discussion this evening. Thank you so much for joining us and for talking to us and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you. I hope I can get to Norwich in person sometime. Yes, we we said we owed we owed you a uh, we, we need to raise a glass, but thank you, thank you so much, John.